Good morning. Xander and Caleb joining in. A round of applause for these guys. Take some guts. We could please pray. God of all glory, on this first day you began creation, bringing light out of the darkness. On this first day you began your new creation, raising Jesus Christ from the darkness of death. On this Lord's Day, grant that we, the people you create by water and the Spirit, may be joined with all your works in praising you for the great glory through Jesus Christ in union with the Holy Spirit. We praise you now and forever. Amen. All right, if you could please stay standing and join the opening hymn number 47. Come out of every 
you. You may be seated. Join your hearts with mine in the call to confession. Doubters, believers, disciples, deceivers, come to the one who makes all things new. The gates of righteousness are open to us and welcome awaits all who enter into the presence of God seeking forgiveness. Lord, together also, Lord, we try to deny our weaknesses and take personal credit for our strengths or strengths. <laughs> we need to often act as though we don't need you or we let our problems get us down and forget that we can call on you anytime for anything. Forgive us when we, our pride inhibits us or we don't believe that you are really there for us. Forgive us when we let our pride, our fears, doubts, and sins against others. We pray, give us your spirit of grace as we lift up our silent confessions. Friends, loving us more than we can imagine, Jesus, too, on all our sins, Jesus took on all our sins by his own death and showed us all God's love and grace by his own resurrection. Then Jesus sent us his spirit to be with us in every way we need. We are forgiven. May the peace be of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, I invite you to stand and share that peace that you have received. Greet each other, welcome each other, share together. You can go to any of the prayer stations that you would like, and then I will call you back and we'll sit down and just have a few moments of resting in the spirit. Zandra. Zandra. singing over me and you have been so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me and you have been so kind of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God.
When I was your foe, your love fought for me And you have been so good to me When I felt no word, you paid it all for me And you have been so good to me So I know that you've heard most of the announcements. There's one other thing I've been asked to remind you all of, that there are no offering plates to be passed during this COVID time. However, don't forget that uh, those of you who are able to contribute to the mission of this church, I believe that there is a place out in the narthex you can put uh, your offering in, or you can mail it in for sure. <laughs> Let's take a moment to calm our spirits.
Please join me now in the prayer for illumination. We pray, Lord, by your spirit, give us understanding as we listen to your ancient words for our hearts today. May they both give healing and hope for our souls. May they both inspire and guide us as your people in the world. Amen. So our Old Testament today is from Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8 through 10. And this is God speaking to everyone, especially to Israel. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, my chosen one, descended from Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, I am saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and will not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. The word of the Lord. So I, I chose to talk about grace this morning. It's my favorite subject. And um, sometimes people ask me, in fact, a lot of times people ask me, why did you become a pastor? Well, it was because I have felt the blessing of God's grace. And uh, I, I just want to add in here for a little bit that when I came to the uh, Denver Presbytery, my husband and I moved out here from California, and um, I felt a lot of grace from the other pastors in this presbytery and the, and the people that, that we were um, getting to know at the time. And that isn't always true. You know, sometimes you're the new person in town and they just sort of stand back and wait to see. You know? But uh, Pastor Gretchen, whom I know many of you know because she was here for quite a while, was one of the first persons to welcome me into this presbytery. And uh, these days, uh, the way I got to know Paula was as a member of a group of uh, clergy women, and we call ourselves WOW. That means women of worship. And we have a good time together and pray for each other. So I'm really glad that Paula can have uh, some time away and that I get to meet you all personally as well. And, and grace is my favorite topic. It's one of those words that we use a lot, but unfortunately not always understood in the same way. I've heard so many times, even from my earliest childhood, and I imagine some of you have heard this too, that we have to make ourselves worthy of grace. That somehow we have to earn it. But that is the exact opposite of what its meaning is. And all through the Bible, God's grace is the message. Like in our Old Testament passage today where Isaiah recalls how God called Abraham and gave him and all his people a new name, Israel. And how being called by name, by God, includes a promise. The promise of God's steadfast presence and forever love. Through Isaiah, God is saying to all who believe, I will never, ever abandon you. No matter what, when you sin, I will forgive you. When bad things happen, when you feel helpless or hopeless, no matter what, I will be with you and I will help you. This is the meaning of grace. And it's the biggest, bestest gift from we have from God. Over and over in the Bible stories, it's the same. Grace, by definition, is a free gift. A gift of unconditional love and acceptance, including forgiveness. 
And the good news is that grace is a gift that just gives and keeps on giving all the days of our lives. And in different ways, given to us each personally according to what our own need is at any one moment in time. My own hand will uphold you, says God. And indeed, 700 years after Isaiah, God's right hand became real for us in Jesus himself. Thank goodness that God understands what we need. Haven't you, like me, I'm sure, often wished that you were better or smarter or wiser, more clever, more of lots of things? I wish I could sing. I really do. <laughs> Haven't you, like me, also suffered under the regrets of too many if-onlys? Can't we each think of things that we wish that we hadn't done or had done differently? Or maybe you're proud that you've done everything right. All your life, you've ticked things off in just the right order. <laughs> And yet there are times when things still go wrong. But Jesus says, for all that we are and for all that we aren't, we've got grace. How cool is that? And when we wish that we were so much more than we think we are, Jesus says, with his grace, we are each enough just as we are. We're all stronger than we think, more able to persevere than we imagine, closer to God's hopes for us than we can see. Like Jesus says in these familiar words from the Beatitudes in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who mourn, those who are poor, those who are meek, who are persecuted, all those in need, for they are each inheritors of the kingdom of God. And aren't these all the weakest times in our lives? And Jesus says they are the times when we can feel the strongest because of our personal relationship with our God. And this is wonderful spiritual strength that we receive, and it's all grace. Not something we've earned, but again, as a free gift. Yet even while Jesus was explaining these things, there was a Pharisee in Jerusalem named Saul. And Saul, along with everyone else, had been seeking the kind of strength that comes from following all the rules all the time. From becoming prosperous and having a certain status in society, doing everything right. Religious people like Saul, along with most of society, believed and taught that weaknesses were a failure, even a punishment. Saul had the best kind of status amongst the Jews. His personal heritage went all the way back to Abraham and then up through Aaron, whose descendants were the priestly tribe of Israel. And his resume included the equivalent of a PhD in biblical law. Saul was very proud of this. And persecuting the followers of Jesus made him feel even prouder that Jesus was a fool, that Jesus was taking people away from what they should be doing and so on and so on. In fact, I imagine that Paul even did a victory dance after Jesus was crucified. Then Saul met Jesus in a most spectacular way. His conversion was the stuff that in today's world they'd make a big movie about. I'm surprised they haven't. There was Saul, riding along at night on that long, long, long road to Damascus, and God literally gets his attention with a lightning bolt. Saul was struck blind, 
what most Jews thought was the ultimate punishment. For three days, he couldn't see people, nor any of the things of this world. Instead, Saul sees up close and personal the risen Jesus, who literally shows him heaven's grace. And then God calls him by a new name. From now on, you're going to be Paul. I always wondered, you know, did Paul have a similar experience to Isaiah's? Was he in heaven surrounded by little flying seraphim singing and maybe hot coals were put to his mouth to absolve his sins or, and to commission him as an apostle? Or did Paul have a conversation with Jesus a marathon discussion expressing all his doubts, arguing back and forth, hardly taking a breath between questions and answers. We'll never know. Except that afterwards, along with his new name, Paul was a changed man. A believer who continued to have amazing spiritual experiences. Times of ecstatic prayer that gave him direction and kept him going as a missionary for Christ with new insights day by day. Paul's travels in Christ's name took him many places, filled with all sorts of adventures. He survived shipwrecks, several floggings. He occasionally had to hide out in caves and made a daring prison escape in a basket lowered down from an upper window and then found himself imprisoned again in a deep, dark, dank hole in the ground in Rome. Paul's spiritual resume was very, very impressive. He could have boasted on it all. He got, could have gotten paid big bucks as a motivational speaker. But instead, Paul lived off what money he could earn as a tent maker. The real story, Paul proclaims, is not about him at all. So we come to our second reading from his own letter to the Corinthians, his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 2 through 10, where he explains what happens. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I do not know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I'd be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. So we remember how before Paul became a Christian, he boasted of his unfailing adherence to the laws of the temple. In truth, most Jews had a resume of their faithfulness based on how many times they brought sacrifices that were acceptable 
and how well they kept the Sabbath and so on and so on. But now, to the Corinthians, Paul talks about himself in an entirely different way. He confesses that it's too easy for him to feel prideful, way too easy for him to say, see how special I am? Paul is saying instead, it's everything that God does for us that is the most important thing to share. So some folks brag about their accomplishments as though they are in some sort of a contest to see who will get first, second, or third place in heaven. Like for who does the best prayers, who gives the most to missions, who makes coffee the most often, and so on. <laughs> Other folks brag about their woes, thinking of their suffering as earning them extra points for martyrdom, maybe, getting God's extra attention, maybe. Paul could have bragged about being the super apostle because of his spiritual gifts, being the superstar missionary with the most new church plantings and being the most long-suffering martyr because of his imprisonments in Rome, and so on and so on. Yet, he says he won't claim any of the above. He won't claim any kind of perfection at all. He won't claim any personal goodness or special faith, nor take any credit of his own survival in hard times. Instead, Paul describes feeling perpetually humbled because of a constant thorn in his flesh from Satan. It's something that drives him to his knees before God, keeps him dependent on God's spiritual strength, makes him reliant on God's grace every single day. I always wonder, did he have a heart condition? Allergies? Irritable bowel syndrome? Peripheral neuropathy, unrelenting back pain? Was he epileptic, attempted constantly by an addiction? I mean, the list could go on, right? But Paul wouldn't name it because he didn't want it to become something that others could pick up on and use. Either like saying they're just like him, or that it could be used to discredit him somehow and become a distraction from his important message about Christ. Probably a good thing they didn't have Facebook back in those days or social media. And Paul also says that this thorn comes from Satan so that everyone will understand that it is not something that God zapped him with as a lesson. No way does he want anyone ever to think that. How often have we heard someone describe whatever their affliction is as a thorn in their side given to them by God as a deserved punishment or as a test of faith? No, no, Paul says. God does not sit up there in heaven and decide who to zap with cancer or the heartbreak of psoriasis or rotten kids instead of good ones, poverty instead of riches, a car accident instead of a near miss, or save one person's house from fire while other houses burn and burn, or in these days get a terrible case of COVID. No. When asked about such things, Jesus said, it rains on both the just and the unjust. And when confronted about why the blind man was blind, Jesus said, it's not the result of sin. Rather, through it, all God's grace can be seen. Another common assumption is that our weaknesses sap our strength. And the longer they're with us, the weaker we get. Even though Paul says he asked God three times to take away his thorn, 
God doesn't. And Paul realizes that instead, Christ has given him something else very different, totally unexpected. Christ has given him the strength to cope. They become coping partners with his weaknesses on a daily basis. And that makes him stronger and stronger and stronger. Paul is saying that just as our troubles don't come from God, neither do our bragging rights. God's strength for us is a gift. And this gift not only is sufficient with all the help that we need, it takes the pressure off of having to become whatever we can never be. Perfect and strong, all by ourselves. So the grace of God's strength allows us to accept our mere humanness. It frees us up from the burden of feeling guilty for all those thorns that prick us willy-nilly. It helps us cope, helps us live with those things we can't do anything about. And yes, God gives us strength for even our greatest fears. This strength is what got me through things back when, many years ago, my own house burned down. It got me through many other crises as well. And I'm sure many of you have also experienced such times. Some years ago, when I was working as a chaplain in a children's oncology ward, it was a roller coaster of emotions for all of the staff. Some children were healed and others weren't. There was one little girl that everyone seemed most worried about. She was such a tiny, frail little thing and in so much pain. And I went to sit with her one day and she asked me to pray for her doctors and her nurses and all of her helpers so that they would not be sad for her. She told me that whether she lived or died, that she was happy because she could always feel God hugging her. And then she got to hug everybody else. I got hugs from her too. And it was remembering those hugs that sustained me all during her funeral service. Whatever Paul's thorn was, he says, as translated in the New Revised Standard Version, that he became content. And in that contentment, even stronger through all his other hardships, for the sake of pointing beyond himself to Christ. Paul wanted people to see right through him to whatever way God's grace is there for them in their situation. And that's my prayer for you all too. That we each see through everything else to the grace gift of God's strength for us in our own lives. We can complain about our weaknesses, our problems, our illnesses, about the many injustices that still need fixing, about how long this COVID pandemic is going to persist, about how vast the fires are burning and how far the smoke is traveling, and the grief that we feel for our losses. Or, we can persevere by trusting in God's everlasting presence with us. We could brag about ourselves and claim extra credit when we do good work, hard work, or we can give credit where credit is really due 
to Christ, our risen Savior, who personally gives us all God's graces. All we have to do is let that grace hug us too. And then we get to share the hugs all around with each other. How cool is that? That's wonderful. We get to share the hugs all around with each other and say, thank you, Lord. In my mind, in my heart, that's worth a hallelujah, amen. So, why don't we do that together? Hallelujah, amen. the spirit does it but I uh, I don't tell the music team what my sermon is <laughs> but always the music goes together doesn't it it always does are there some amongst you who would like to share particular prayer requests at this time What's her name? Nissa. Nissa. Okay. So we want to pray for Nissa that she comes through the surgery and that her recovery is okay too. Right? Yeah. So, Lord, hear our prayer. Yeah. Prayers also for Pamela recovering from surgery. And uh, she might have some other treatments along the way, too. It's will be a while, right? It's endurance. Pray for endurance as well. Lord, hear our prayer for Pamela. Wow. 
What's his name? Lee? Dean. So Dean's prayer is, hallelujah, thank you for being able to stand up at last again. Lord, hear Dean's prayer and all of his family's thankfulness in the back. Yes, absolutely. That's a helpless situation, isn't it? And uh, the, the families, the women and the girls all that are in a lot of danger, particularly, too. Uh, pray for, as always, the end of wars and peace. We pray for our um, troops that are there or in the process of leaving and for the folks that helped American troops that are trying to escape as well. Together, Lord, hear our prayers. Other particular requests? I want to thank God for the precious little girl here. <laughs> we all started out that way, you know. <laughs> Paralysis cure is exciting. Yes, it's going to happen. And we want to keep in, in that same prayer group those other, other researches that are being done for other uh, terrible things that, that we go through. You know. um, none of us are superhuman, are we? Lord, we pray for... We pray first in thanksgiving, Lord, for your presence with us, for the gift of grace that includes this ongoing conversation that we can have with you called prayer, for the privilege, Lord, of being able to lift up our thorns and our cares and our concerns and share with you, Lord, the people we love and what they're going through and, and by our prayers lay hands on them and by your spirit be connected with all they're going through. There are so many more than what has been mentioned out loud. There are the silent things that we keep in our hearts or the the folks that we just don't know how much they themselves want to share. But we appreciate, Lord, the gift that you give us of calling on your name, of being able to be your people together with each other, to come alongside each other in different ways according to needs and to by your spirit even pray for those who are far, far away. We think about the war in Afghanistan, Lord, and we think about other places in the Middle East where there just seems to be an ending, an ending pain and suffering. But we also think, Lord, about where there is hunger, where there are very minimal doctors and medicines and the people who have been unable to get the treatments that they need. The list is long, Lord, and we are so grateful that you can see right into us and all the things that are on our hearts and minds. We pray for this church, Lord. We pray for all the different things that you have called it to be and do, the way it has shared food and 
uh, helpful items and the way it has been so important in this community. And the way it reaches out through its other uh, relationships with the Presbyterian churches and, and uh, beyond. We pray for Pastor Paula as she is on her trip. And, and I know that, that she's going to be really busy. And so we pray that also some of that be downtime. We pray, Lord, for our own families, our children, our grandchildren our friends and our neighbors. We pray for an end to the fires that are ravaging so many homes again and communities leaving them desperate. And the smoke, Lord, that just never seems to quit and goes farther and farther each day, Lord. We pray for relief and help and healing we pray for strength, for perseverance and endurance. We pray for all that we can be, that you have called us to be, as we have been called by name by you, Lord. And in the same way, Lord, we pray back to you the prayer that your own son Jesus taught us to pray all together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors. It's not into temptation, 